Welcome to WCAT. I'm Kiki Latimer, and I'm your host for the Catholic Bookworm. And I'm happy to have with me today Caitlin Slater from uh, JP, the great Catholic University, uh, San Diego, correct? <laughs> yes, we're just north of San Diego in Escondido. Okay, welcome, Caitlin. Thank you so much. Um, how about you start us off with a brief prayer? Sure. Track. <laughs> okay, sounds great. <laughs> Let's pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. You know us so well, and you see all that you have made it and created and call it good. So we just ask that during this interview, this conversation, for all of our listeners, that we would first and foremost root ourselves in the goodness of God and how you see us, and then in everything that we make, that we would offer it back to you as an offering of love from ourselves and to our fellow human beings. And we pray in the words that Jesus taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So um, this is, I think, the third or fourth in a series of interviews that I've done um, with um, the, the, um, the people teaching in the film department at JP Catholic. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's film and media, correct? Yes. Yeah, so we've got our biggest program is film. And then kind of within that, you've got directors, producers, actors, writers. Um, we've also got like business, theology. So there's a lot of different programs, but kind of the biggest one is the film and creative arts. So okay. yeah, I'd be taking courses if I lived closer. I just oh. recently saw that there's some free online thing that I'm going to like poke my nose into because yes. it's so fascinating. Really, really yeah. fascinating. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Yeah, so I'm um, originally from Rochester, Minnesota. Um, so I grew up, yeah, there most of my childhood. Um, I started, <laughs> my, my first show was when I was 12. Um, I did Punk Junior, which is the uh, musical version of The Ugly Duckling. And I played a turkey. And um, so that was my very first kind of introduction. I had never acted before. I, my dad would always take us to theater growing up. And so I, I really liked it, but I had never done it before. So, um, and I, I was really lucky back in, in Rochester to have um, a really solid theater program there. And it was actually run by a homeschool dad. I was homeschooled. So um, this group was just really good kids, really like collaborative group and, um, he really just let us do so many cool things through that theater. So obviously there was the acting side of it, but then he would have, he really believed in like the power of children and that, that kids can do things. And um, so he would have us directing, he would have us stage managing, like building the sets, um, doing even like marketing and stuff for the group. And so um, the more and more I did that, it just, it just became almost full time, like through, through high school. Um, and and then I was looking kind of yeah, near the end of high school, really trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. <laughs> and um, it was between theater and theology for me, actually, because I, I had a deep love of theology. And um, but then I had just a deep love for for the arts and for storytelling. And I, I didn't know where to go. And um, friends of my parents came across JP Catholic um, and they were like, you know, this this looks really cool. And so we went and visited a couple of times and then, yeah, I ended up going there in um, 2014 and um, went through the acting program there. And um, I graduated in 2017 and I started like auditioning, doing theater around San Diego area. And then um, I started TA work for JP Catholic. Um, Lee Esky, who founded the program, he really needed a TA at that point. And so I started doing a bit of teaching work with him. And then um, as of 2022, I came on full time um, as the creative director of the program there. So, um, yeah, that's just a little bit about the journey there. <laughs> you really got to bring your theology and your your acting and theater together. Yes, that was like one of wow. the biggest <laughs> gifts of God. Like, I just can't even 
like the, the the acting program, and, and I can talk more about this, but but the way Lieski teaches is he incorporates theology of the body. Um, I don't know if people know about that work of of JP2, but um he really incorporates kind of a way of living theology of the body into the acting program. So that it's not just like me as the actor and then me as the Christian, but it's like me, Caitlin, and and everything that I do is um for God. And it was like the most integrated program I, I had ever experienced. That really changed my life. And so, um, yeah, you're so right. Like they, they really go together. That's a, that's what an awesome thing to be able to do. I mean, my background is, is, was in the oral interpretation of literature originally at, um, university of Rhode Island, um, which was a secular university. So the theater department was not like bound up, um, in any kind of, well, it was bound up in a secular theology. Um, but I was very blessed at the time the philosophy department at the University of Rhode Island was pretty predominantly Catholic mm. slash Christian. Um, there were a few Protestant professors, um, but by an, an accident, by the divine accident of God, it had become a Catholic philosophy department, um, which led to my conversion to Catholicism. Um, so I was sort of strangely at a secular university at that time that's no longer the case now there I, I don't believe but at the time it was a, a strange thing to bump into um, and uh, actually my primary um, oral interpretation of literature professor was also um, a, a beautiful Catholic woman that I was very oh. blessed to she was brilliant and I was really blessed to study under her so so I kind of got that a tiny bit of what that's like, but uh, I'm sure not like JP Catholic, which is really yeah. exciting. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's beautiful how I think to the Catholic Church and like obviously um, just Christians in general, like there's such an understanding of art at a deeper level than can can be encountered in kind of just the secular world. I mean, I work in secular theater and I I love the people that I meet there so deeply, but it's like. Like the reason that they do art is so different. Like it's just there's a piece missing of like why, like why even art matters, you know, in the first place. So, I so you mentioned being homeschooled, and I saw in something that I read about you recently, you were involved with Romeo and Juliet. Yes, yeah, and yeah. I helped um, direct that at, at JP Catholic last. I guess it was in the March this past March. Yeah, that immediately, my, my children were homeschooled, um, and some of my grandchildren are being homeschooled, but. Um, Shakespeare and, and Romeo and Juliet in particular was a big deal in our household. <laughs> really? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. In fact, my daughters, Katie and Jenny, um, there, there was always a big argument over who would play Romeo and who would play Juliet, you know, <laughs> and uh, Jenny usually, um, want, Katie usually wound up being Juliet only because she was older, so she had a little more power in the, in the situation. Um, but we loved our our Shakespeare days. They were just just wonderful. Yes. Well, it's so funny because growing up in Rochester with the the troupe that I was with all through high school, um, kind of my first introduction to Shakespeare was we would do Shakespeare in the Park, and so we would um, in the summer, like during kind of a two to three week festival of the city, we would put on yeah Shakespeare in the Park. We'd have like we had this really large minstrel wagon that would like kind of wheel in and, and musicians on top of it. And then we'd, um, yes, yeah, so we had live music and then we would do a Shakespeare part play and we would like be using the entire park. It was, it was just really fun. So I, I love Shakespeare too. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So at JP Catholic, you are the creative director of the acting program. Yes. Which I, I, I told you made me smile because like, you're not just the director, you're the creative director. Creative. Yeah. So you've got to be really good. <laughs> exactly. It's a you great title. It's a great title. Yeah. I don't know what you do like on a daily basis there. Yeah, gosh, it really kind of varies. I mean, there's a ballpark of things that I do, and then each day can kind of vary from that. So one of the things that I do is I work really closely with Lieski, who founded the program, and um, he still teaches there as well. So we kind of bounce ideas off each other, kind of of the the overview of the program and and each individual student. And where we see their growth and, and how to kind of push them and um, where to take the program and different ideas associated with that. 
Um, kind of more the day to day, I think is, well, I, I plan our seasons. So I, I decide what shows we're going to do. So, you know, I chose Romeo and Juliet for last year and different, we do, um, normally a play in the fall and then, um, we do a Shakespeare play in the winter and then we often do a summer musical and then kind of scattered throughout that there are different student projects that I'm mentoring and, and different projects that students are leading and wow. performing. So, um, yeah, planning of the season, and then a lot of what I do is actually directing and then teaching. Well, I'll teach a lot of the different classes, and um, and then direct direct the different plays, and a lot of it's meeting with with different students as well, and um, just kind of seeing seeing how they're doing, you know, working different scenes or um, mentoring them and teaching acting. Yeah, yeah. So I teach a lot of their core courses, along with Lieski. And then I'll teach, um, you know, quite a few of their other their other acting courses as well throughout their time there. Um, and just spend a lot of time with them. And, you know, kind of, the, I think one of the most important parts of my job is, is really getting to know them as people. And um, kind of like we were saying at the beginning, a lot of acting and, and faith is like, it's all tied so closely together that if I get to know them as people, I get to know them as actors. Um, and so a lot of it's, you know, just, just spending time with them and, and working on different things and um, yeah, just kind of bringing them along throughout their time. So. Well, you know, I taught homiletics, um, teaching, you know, priests, seminarians, how to give a homily. That's awesome. Um, and there's a lot of similar things. I mean, my book is home for the homily and there's a lot of, acting in some sense um in the best sense of the word involved with homily because if you have to learn how to bring your person into what you're saying um and and that can be hard to do that can be a hard thing for someone to let go and really let their true self shine through um in 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 something that they're reading in in the lecturing mm -hmm. Um, in the character um, that they're to, to give us particular message. I mean, you're looking for a, a message and inspiration both on the stage when you're acting or in a film, um, but in a sense in the same thing where you're trying to show Jesus to the world uh, from the pulpit, it can be a very similar type thing that you're doing. Yeah. Well, I loved what you said about like, it's about bringing your person, right? And like, like, letting yourself be there because I think so often a like misconception about acting is that it's lying. I don't know if you've heard that. That's kind of like a typical, like, like actors must be good liars. And it's like, well, <laughs> it's, it's so interesting because it's actually the opposite, right? That, that in order to act, it's actually about telling the truth. And of course that truth is, is under imaginary circumstances. Um, our, our working definition of acting is doing truthfully under imaginary circumstances. Um, and so it's, it's that I'm actually going to the root of true humanity and like what human beings actually do, but it's imaginary. Right. So it's, it's, but it's, it's all me. It's all my own human person. That's, that's doing that, you know, at the same time, if you're a really good actor, we lose sight of you and the character, the, the message comes through. And, and that always fascinates me because it's the same in mm -hmm. homily is that, you know, I'll say to them, we don't want to see you, we want to see Jesus. You know, mm -hmm. we don't want to see you, we want to see Hamlet. Um, you know, and, and yet it's when you lose yourself that you find yourself. It's that weird, yes. strange balance of you let go of yourself and this amazing truth can just pour through you and you can be Hamlet um, and you can be St. Mark or Matthew for us. Um, mm -hmm. And that truth comes through and we lose sight of you and yet we don't. It, it, yes. To me, that, that miracle of that is amazing. Yes, it's so beautiful. And it's like, it's such a self-gift, you know, same with, with I'm sure with like our, our priests and, you know, it, um, yeah, there's something so beautiful that Lieski, again, who founded the program says, he says it, it always costs something and it's, it's, um, there's a cost of love, you know, and the self-gift of like, um, artists within that journey of of losing yourself and finding yourself so 
It reminds me of that line in T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, costing not less than everything, <laughs> but yeah. all shall be well. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Mm. It's a fascinating thing. You know, I, I talk about, you know, if like in the lecturing program, when you're proclaiming the gospel, you're proclaiming, you know, um, the New or Old Testament, um, a lot of times they'll say, well, you, you don't want someone to be, to be affected. You know, you don't want that affected thing happening. It's you want just the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, and I always try to explain that if you speak from your mouth and you're up here, it comes across as very affected. Mm -hmm. If you just speak from your heart, if you fall in love with what you're saying, if you understand what you need to say and you fall in love with it, then it's not affected. And, yeah. and as listeners, as viewers, we instantly know the difference. It's, it's a fascinating thing. We instantly know if someone is, is Hamlet or they're trying to be Hamlet. You know, we instantly know in the gospel, are you, are you, are you Jesus for us in that moment? Are you trying to pretend to be Jesus? So that's the lie as opposed to just being who you're meant to be in that moment. Yes, it, it, it's a it's such a fine line, you know, and to try to teach that is exciting. I have found. Yes, well, it's it's so fun and and difficult and challenging and beautiful all at the same time. And you know, that's why I love theater so much. I mean, I I have an appreciation for film. Obviously, film deeply moves me. I love it. Um, I've done a little bit of it. I think for me, it's 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 more difficult actually. And it's not something I enjoy quite as much as theater, but I think in, in one of the differences is that, that, um, well, I mean, it kind of the, the general consensus is that at theater, you can be bigger, you know, whatever that means. Right. But I think what, what's actually theater allows you to, to do is that it takes, like you were saying, like you're, it's not just your, your words or kind of a part of you, but it's taking your full, your your like your fullest self and allowing it to be fully expressed and that includes the emotional life that includes with your words with your physicality with like every drop of who you are it allows it to kind of be be fully put out there whereas film because the camera's right there um it it tends to be a little bit like uh just a smaller expression of that humanity because the camera picks up you know everything um but yeah, but yeah I just have a chance with film, like you can redo it. Yeah, you know, is, uh, theater is just that live experience, and whatever happens, happens. It's yes. it sounds more like real life. You know, whatever happens, happens. You're not going to get a second chance to do this moment. And, yes. You know, um, I, there was a wonderful. I, I saw a, a production of Camelot a few mm. years back, and. Um, Robert Goulet, who had originally played Lancelot, was now, you know, 30 or 40 years later playing, um, playing, playing King Arthur. And so Lancelot delivered a line that, of course, he had done 40 years earlier, and he was supposed to respond to that line, but instead he just started laughing. And on live stage, the two of them just completely lost it. And we're just howling with laughter, doubled over. And of course, the audience just joined them. And it's just this precious yeah. moment because they knew, you know, he had been Lancelot, you know, years mm -hmm. earlier. And it was just priceless. So you, you just never know what's going to happen with live theater. You um, never know. My mother was taken on a first and last date with a gentleman. They were in the balcony seeing arsenic and old lace. And she tells me that when the murderer jumped through the window, she, as a 22-year-old 20, young woman in the balcony, screamed her full head off. <laughs> and again, it was one of those moments where the whole audience, we had the scariest moment in the play, started laughing. Everyone <laughs> on stage lost their composure. <laughs> She was sort of, afterwards, she said she wanted to leave with, you know, sort of a bag over her head. Oh. You just never know what's going to happen with live theater. You know? Yes. Well, it's such a collaborative storytelling kind of like art form, too, because you you do have the element of the live audience. And there's this give and take between actors and audience. 
sense that like both are essential to, to theater in a really wonderful way, you know, and um, things happen I, that you don't expect. Yes. <laughs> all the Especially time. The children. Yes. When I, when I was in college, I took Theater 101 and I got to be a mouse and it was a Raggedy and Andy, Raggedy Ann and Andy play. And at one point, Raggedy and Andy fell out the window and they had brought in like 500, like first, second and third graders to see the play at the university. And so when Raggedy Andy fell out the window, um, Raggedy Ann was supposed to turn to me, the mouse, and say, where could he be? And we had no expectation that 500 children were going to yell, he fell out the window. <laughs> That's amazing. That was not part of the script at all. And, and we did, I believe, three shows with 500 children each. And in every, every single time, all 500 children yelled, he fell out the window. And when wow. she didn't react to that, they got even more upset and just yelled it all the louder. Um, <laughs> so we had to kind of adjust the play to the children. Um, oh my gosh! They just felt they were part of the part of the story. Um, yeah, like adults who know they're yes. not. Children don't know that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> so, it was priceless. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Yeah, I mean, I growing up kind of with you know, the, the troop in, in Rochester too, one of the big elements was, was teaching the younger kids. So I actually grew up teaching kids before teaching in, in college. And there's something so magical, like you were saying about like children, because they, they're spontaneously creative without having to, well, kind of going back to like, they don't have to be a character. They just are, they just experience it and they experience it in real time. You know, you can like gather them together. One of my favorite games is like gathering them together and being like, okay, there's a monster here. We have to go find the monster. Right. And like taking them on a little, like improvised, you know, scavenger hunt or whatever. And the minute you start that, it's like, they all, you know, buy it right away. And it's just so beautiful. Like, it's like, we have to go to school to learn how to be children in a sense, you know, it's, it's like, it's just so, they're just such beautiful creators and yeah. What's your favorite thing about working with young people at JP Catholic? Gosh. Hard. Yeah. So many things. I mean, for one thing, I just have amazing students. Like they are just um, beautiful human beings. Like just like, yeah, just, just wonderful, thoughtful. Like they're so honest about their struggles and, and their wants. And I think one of my favorite things is as kind of like, because I get to know them so well, is to actually see their their deep struggles and their deep wounds. Um, and I just see like how Jesus um, is magnified in those, those wounds so often. And sometimes those come out on stage, right? Because they're doing the deep work of the actor. And so their, their deep kind of personhood comes out. Um, but another thing that I just love is they're so open to the journey and they're so open to their highs and lows. And something that we explore a lot in the acting program is um, we call it like the ache or the pang, right? And it's like, it's that part of us that wants something, but so often we have to shut it down because, um, well, we often shut it down so we don't have to feel it, right? So we turn to technology or we turn to... Um, you know, alcohol or whatever those things are that we kind of dole that that part of us that just wants more. Ultimately, it's a want for God, right? Um, but but the the way that we go through the program is to actually get in touch with that ache of like it, you've got to be able to feel it in order for God to fill it, right? So um, and that's hard. That's really really challenging because it can almost be a panicked feeling. I know sometimes when I'm feeling that, especially actually silence kind of brings it on, right? Or silent prayer. And you just start feeling, at least for me, it's just this kind of like, oh no, I've got to go do something, right? I can't just sit with that, that because it's it's scary and it's challenging and we don't know what it is, right? And so um, we, we encounter that a lot in the program. And some students, um, it's it's almost too challenging. They have to kind of, um, they, they have a really hard time being in touch with that, that their humanity. But a lot of the students, especially the ones we have on campus now, and the, the class that just graduated, um, 
they're willing to go there and to to encounter God there. And um, and it's just been so inspiring for me and I think for just the program in general to to have students um on campus that are willing to do that. So that's one of my favorite favorite parts. So when a student arrives there, what would be and they want to become an actor, what would be it's let's say the first course they would take with you? Would they take it with you or yes. Yes, they would take it. So um Lieski and I co-teach acting one. So very aptly named. Um and and acting one is really a journey of self self-discovery. So um yeah, actually, I mean, kind of like I was saying, before they even get a script in their hands, before they do any kind of like character work, it's it's really all about them. And um and, and so acting one is is the first class in which we really turn towards them as human beings. And um our program is based on the the acting kind of philosophy of Stanislavski and Sanford Meisner. Um they Stanislavski lived in in Russia and um and then Stanford Meisner kind of helped spread his teachings in the U.S. through the group theater in New York. And there's kind of a whole backstory to that. But but pretty much they, um, well, especially Stanislavski, who's then teaching, came to America, revolutionized the whole idea of what acting is by um, realizing that it's meant to be truthful. Because before Stanislavski came on the scene, it was very much about kind of big postures and and speaking in a very you know, actor voice. And, and he was like, there's got to be something more to this. So he really kind of started that whole trend of, of realizing that acting is, is um, truthful, that it's, it's meant to express humanity. And so um, there are different exercises that we do in acting one to get to the truth of the moment. It's all about the truth of the present moment. And, and that's really the foundation for everything else that they do. Reminds me of times when a seminarian has read something that I'm teaching, and uh, I just say, "I don't, I don't believe you." Yeah, <laughs> you know, like what? And I'm like, "I don't believe anything you just said." Mm. You know, um, and sometimes I've turned to the classes. Does anyone believe what you just? And everyone's like, "No," you know. And sometimes I've had a seminarian go and speak to the wall instead of speaking to the class. Just go off, but go over there by yourself in that corner and and do the same lines, but just to the wall so that you're not like doing anything for us. Find, you know, it's that thing of finding the truth. Yeah. Finding the truth, find it. And, yeah. You know, um, and, and sometimes I'll say, okay, now I want you to whisper it. Now I want you to shout it. Now I want you to just, you know, and again, it's using different tools to get one, get someone. I've never thought of it in those terms, but it, it's to find the truth in what you're, what you're saying, what you're proclaiming. Um, yes. Because if you don't find it, why bother us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't bother me from the pulpit. Don't bother me. You know, there's no point if, if it stays on that unreal sort of a lie level. It's got to it's gotta be truthful. Um, and, and that's that heart thing. You know, you yeah. really, you know, it's one thing for your intellect to know something. You know, like, you know, the devil knows Jesus in his mm -hmm. intellect. You know, he's got a brilliant intellect. He doesn't know Jesus in his heart. He has no heart, you know. Yeah. Um, so we have to know the truth, not just intellectually, but it really has to come through the heart. I mean, Dietrich von Hildebrand talked about, you know, the importance of the heart. Mm. Um, we have to, it has to come through that, you know. Mm -hmm. If you have not love, you are that clangy symbol, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Just think like, like you were saying the beauty of the, the heart, um, kind of in terms of, of like the acting and the homeless and, um, that, that it's such a, a courageous and brave journey to embrace the heart, you know, because it's, um, the heart experiences great pain and great joy. And, um, it's, it's really beautiful when a person can embrace both, you know, and, and live from that, that, place yeah students are in your classes generally so yeah generally there's between like eight to 14 that's kind of the general number that we've had the past few years that's a nice size group to work with yes yeah. yes and then they can get to they yeah they can get to know each other and and us and and it's it kind of forms a, a collaborative cohort i would say what's the hardest thing 
you would think that like if I were asking them what's the hardest thing you deal with getting started in acting what would what have you seen that they struggle with yeah I think um oh that's a really good question I, mean, I think a lot of them are in a new place. They're just in school for the first time. They're yeah. freshmen. Are they? Do they come to you as freshmen? They do. They do. Um, yeah. So there's the typical like you know homesickness and adjustments, and and also I think just wanting a community and wanting close friends, and you know loneliness can be a huge struggle. And um, and I think within terms of of acting, they would probably say the hardest thing is vulnerability, I think, to kind of start taking down those walls. And that's hard, you know, especially when you don't know anyone, you're in a new class of, of people, you know, it's, it just, it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I think that's probably one of the most challenging things. I have a whole discussion about vulnerability in my homiletics book. Yeah. Because truth it's it's hard to be truthful if you aren't vulnerable. Yes. I mean, yeah. it's part of humility. I mean, if you're not going to be, you know, arrogance is that type of thing that keeps you from being humble and from being truthful. And yeah. vulnerable. I mean, love makes you vulnerable. Yeah. You might laugh at me. You might think I'm a jerk, you know. Yeah. So, so true. It's like that C.S. Lewis quote. I think it's C.S. Lewis, like, to love anything is to be vulnerable. Because, well, it can ultimately break your heart. But, like, you can keep it, your heart safe and locked away and stuff. But you you won't experience anything, right? And it'll ultimately, like, make you suffer. <laughs> so, yeah. Choose which suffering you're going to take. <laughs> yeah. And I was thinking what you said, you know, you brought up the 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 concern of loneliness, um, but also you mentioned earlier silence. Um, I've taught some courses on silence. Um, and I often think that, I don't know if you've ever seen the uh, TV series Alone, where they drop people off in the middle of like Vancouver Island, 10 people, and you know, whoever, whoever, and they're all separated. And they have their, they, they film themselves and it's completely, it's a, it's not like, naked and afraid where there's, you know, somebody right there, cameraman, they do all their own camera work and they just, oh. somebody goes in once every week or two and just make sure they're, they're not dead and that they're not starving to death, but they have to do their own food and everything, but they're alone. Um, and whoever's alone, the longest wins. Um, it's a fascinating series oh. because it's so realistic. Um, but there was one season, you know, everyone's, I mean, thousands of people apply to be the 10 men or women who go out there. So, you know, they're screened and all of this. And I just remember that third or fourth season, I, there's been 11 seasons now. Um, one guy, you know, he was very tough and brave and, you know, he was sort of a Boy Scout type and he was really, you know, going to go out there and claim the wilderness. And he didn't make it through the first night. They they all have a call so they can call and check out at any time. But he didn't make it through the first night. Mm -hmm. He heard a bear or something and it was all over. Um, wow. And I've always been interested in that because he wasn't, he had no, he had the ability probably to survive in the wilderness as far as survival skills go, except for the survival skill of being alone and dealing with loneliness and silence um and is you know and, and that fascinates me a lot how loud silence can get and how loud mm -hmm. you know being alone for the first time um when my husband and i came to rhode island for college i mean we got married really early but i remember sitting on the beach when we first came to rhode island and just wailing because yeah. we were alone, we were together, but we were alone for the first time, away yeah. from family and friends. Um, but at the same time, I would think with film and theater, um, loneliness can really help you tap into your heart, um, because yeah. it is such a heart experience. Yes. I mean, when you feel homesick, man. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. It like, well, it's so, yeah, you're so right. And I think like, 
there's something, I love what you said about how loud silence can be. Um, Cause it really, that's the best way to describe it. Like it's, I think every human being knows what that means, even though it's almost like how to explain it. But it reminds me of like, there's this quote by um, Paul Benedict actually, when he was Pope and he, he writes about um, like the pathos of an actor and, and the, um, the amount of like being in touch with that, that ache or that passion that it takes, right. And that it, it takes you to the, the depths of kind of the human experience and, and the joys of it. Right. But, but that it's, it's all meant um, to reveal the, the, the human person and, and our humanity. And, um, and I think silence puts us in touch with that, you know, because it's so uncomfortable and, and loneliness and all of those, those deep human experiences that, that yeah, almost every character is also going through, you know? So, um, you know, there's this, this beautiful teaching of like, in acting one, we say there is no character, right? Like it's, it's just you, it's, it's words on a page and you, and it's, everything comes through me. Now in acting two, acting three, scene study, kind of the later courses, we delve into what that actually means. Like, of course there is a character also not, right? It's, it's, it's still me, but it's under different imaginary circumstances. So their expressions of life or their wants might be different than me, right? But ultimately, something that that Lieski says is that I'm a human being and therefore nothing is foreign to me, right? So in a sense, I can empathize and I can stretch into any kind of uh, human capacity that there is. I can, in a sense, play any character, right? And so I think the more we allow for silence and the more we we sit with our our ache our pain and and take it to god right um the more that is going to allow for for deeper character work that that i mean the more you take it to god then you get that grace and you have that ability of course to cooperate with grace Yes. Um, then we do things gracefully. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> like how we do things left to our own accord. You know? Yeah. Um, Lord have mercy. <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I, I want to mention just one other thing. I know we don't have too much more time, but you mentioned um, something what you call the humor of humanity. Yes. Yes, I do. Um, yeah, the humor of humanity, I think... For me, life is ultimately, this sounds a little contradictory to what I've been saying, so I'll try to explain myself, but life is ultimately funny and human beings are ultimately funny and um, not funny in like a, a mockery. I think sometimes when we we talk about like the the humor of, of human beings where we sometimes I think what we mean is like they're stupid or they're, you know, we kind of mock it. But I think life is ultimately, you know, it's interesting. I was, I was actually just, this is kind of coming from, um, I was having a talk, this is probably a year ago now, but with one of our theology professors on campus, um, his name is Steve Cramp and, um, he has a very dry sense of humor and, um, and we were talking about actually Shakespeare's comedies and, um, what that means, right. To, for something to be a comedy and, and he had mentioned how, comedy ultimately points to the divine comedy right like um if if our christian history ends on good friday it's complete and utter tragedy right and um but as we all believe it ends on sunday with the resurrection right and so depending on the perspective of when the story ends life is either tragic or comic um sometimes both in in any given moment it can be both very funny and very tragic but but i think something really important to remember this is something that i need to be reminded of constantly is that life is ultimately a comedy right like it it i believe ends god willing in heaven and that that in heaven we see everything and how it all made sense right how every every moment if we're surrendered to god's grace um you know make sense in in grace and and that God was working in every moment. And so I think like um it's so easy, at least for me, to kind of get down and be like, life is terrible. You know, it's like painful. And because it is, but also 
um, the, the humor of humanity, I think like life is funny and it, it reminds me ultimately that God has won and he is Victor and all is well, you know? And so it ends ultimately in kind of the, the highest divine comedy. I often wonder how people get through life without humor. My my family is quite funny. My daughter, Katie, runs the Rogue, what's called the Rogue Island Comedy Festival. Um, right. It's funny, I asked her the other day, you know, what what makes comedy? And and her answer was truth and timing. Oh, it's great. Hard. Truth and timing. Yes. But, you know, during the most difficult times of my life, it's it's really been humor that's helped myself and other people sort of get to the core of of things and uh, you know I remember the week my mom was was dying and uh, my sister and our brother were all sort of sleeping in the waiting room for a week and uh, you know it was just this crazy thing she was in the ICU and um, at one point I turned to my brother and sister and I said you know I'm not going I'm not this is never going to happen to me I said because I'm a stuffed animal <laughs> I said, I, there's no like kidneys and liver and all this stuff that we're dealing with with mom. I'm a stuffed animal. And um, so, you know, we all laughed. And um, but then a week later, um, I, a week and a half later, I had to pick up mom's ashes at the funeral mm -hmm. home. And um, so I got them and I came out and I was sitting in the car and we had to, my husband was driving, we had to stop and get gas. And so I had this, this box of ashes, you know, on my lap in the car. And of course, I could tell like curiosity was getting the better of me because it was this plastic box and it was like, well, I've got to open this box. Well, the box, the ashes were in there in a plastic bag, but above them, because sometimes they have to ship the ashes, they put stuffing, like the kind of stuffing you'd find in a stuffed animal. So when I opened mom's box of ashes to see what these things look like, what came out at first was stuffing. Oh my gosh. It's just hysterically funny because I said, look, because the kids had already heard the story. I said, look, grandma was a stuffed animal, too, because <laughs> all this fluff came out. And it was just this priceless, fun morning with the moment that I was able to later on in the day share with my brother and sister. I said, look, you got to see the ashes because, you know, mom was a stuffed animal, too. And it was oh. just precious. Um, and that whole week, I mean, many times in my life where there's been deep, deep sorrow, it's, it's humor that's deeper. There, yeah. There's a, there's something more real and more honest and more true about humor and, yes. and those things that are just deeply funny. Um, the, the stuffing was far more real than the ashes were. Mm. You know, there was a reality in in the joy of the stuffing that was far more real than the the ashes. And, yes. and we all knew it. Yeah. So Yeah. Well, I think Jesus so compassionately speaks to us through humor often. Like that was like a gift for you, you know, and your family. And oh, yeah. and it's like he's right in there, like in the he's joke. Right you know? Yeah. He's in the joke with us. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Um, is there any, I mean, there's so, I'm sure we could talk for hours and I know we don't have that much time, but is there anything that you'd like to tell us about JP Catholic or your teaching that's super important? Oh gosh. Um, you know, you <laughs> I know there's so many things that, um, but no, I, I feel pretty complete. I think like, um, obviously anyone out there who's interested in JP Catholic, like they can find my information on, on our website. I'm more than happy to either do a zoom call with, um, you know, people that are potentially interested or, um, you know, just connect with parents who, you know, are looking at places for their kids. But, um, I think like it's a very unique school. It's a very small school. So it's definitely not for everyone. Um, it was the perfect school for me. I, I have no doubt that Jesus placed me there and it, um, you know, changed my life. And, um, so I'm always excited to meet people that are also, you know, called there. Um, but yeah, in terms of like, you know, future actors or actresses, like, I think um, just started tuning to kind of like we were, what we were talking about the past while of of just your own humanity and and um, and I think just the final thing that I'll end on is um, this is something that that we really discuss a lot in acting one, but um, it's a teaching of Saint Ignatius and and he would say that there's always a personal love language for every single human being and um, 
And in my experience, that personal love language that that God speaks to me, like, why do I love the music that I love? And maybe you love the music you love or the ways in which, you know, God speaks to us are so vast and so different. And um, we can start paying attention to those things. And sometimes it's not even just things that might seem holy, like it's not just in prayer, but it's, it's, you know, the outdoors or yeah, music is a huge one or what kind of movies make me laugh or, um, and, and to start paying attention to what those, those things are because God is right, right there. And, um, so I would just tell everyone to, to, um, yeah, begin experiencing what you're experiencing and, and, um, God wants the true version of you. And so whatever's true about you to like bring that to prayer and, um, and you'll find him there. So, what are some of your favorite movies, by the way? Oh man, you know, man. You know so <laughs> oh, so many movies have moved me very deeply. I think um, one movie that had a profound impact me on it on me as a kid was it's called A River Runs Through It, and it was actually one of my dad's favorite movies. So he showed it to me growing up, and. Um, that one, for some reason, like just really pierced me. And so it's it has a very special place because it, it was I watched it when I was just a child. Um, but then, I mean, I love like. Um, I, I also love things like, oh, what was that movie with? Um, like, I love certain war movies and, and I love dramas, comedies. I mean, there's just so many um, that speak to me. But yeah. Well, what's your favorite book? Favorite book is probably The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. Yeah, about her journey of um, her and her sister. Like they were Christians helping to hide Jews during World War II. And then they were taken into the concentration camps. And um, and just the like the absolute surrender that they had to Jesus of like everything is his will, like every moment. And that profoundly changed my life. So we, I often, you know, use the expression from that, you know, give thanks to the fleas. Yes. Favorite lines in that book. Give thanks to the fleas. Yes. Oh, and I just she, love it. And her sister was like, no, I draw the line at the fleas, yes. but it was the fleas that were protecting them from the, the vicious guards at the time. Yes. And that whole concept about, do we always tell the truth when, she, you know, the Jew, when the, the Nazis came and they said, are you hiding Jews? And she mm -hmm. said, yeah, they're under the table. And yeah. she gets slapped for it. But they were under the table. That was the truth. Yeah. Because they didn't look under the table. So God protected oh. her in her belief that she should tell, always tell the truth. Yeah. So, was, so many things. And, of course, that final scene where she, she has to shake the hand of the Nazi guard who's asked for forgiveness. And she says, yeah. can't do it. And she says she feels Jesus just pick up her arm and move it forward. You yes. Know, that, that's a beautiful book. It's Isn't it so? Well, and actually, Corey is buried. I just, it was actually during COVID. I think it was 2020 or 2021. I was like, you know, all bored. I wasn't, didn't know what to do. And I, I realized that she's buried in Santa Ana, which is like maybe 40 minutes from, from where I live. And so I, I went and visited her tomb and wow. it, it's just such a plain, like kind of just slab at this beautiful cemetery in Santa Ana, but it, it just says Jesus is Victor. And that often like speaks to me, just that it's just such a simple statement just on her, her tombstone. And, um, obviously they were, they were Protestant, but I, I prayed at Corey and Betsy almost every day and, um, asked their intercession and I oh, just we're Catholic now. <laughs> yes. I just love them so much. So it's an amazing um, story. An amazing yeah. Story of faith and, and yeah. perseverance and, um, yeah. 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 Great book. Um, I always recommend the film Railway Man. Have you seen Railway Man with Colin Firth? No, that's, I have not. That's a, that's a way. It's kind of a sleeper because, I mean, everyone knows Colin Firth, but no one knows about the, the, probably one of his most amazing films is The Railway Man. And it's a true story. Um, okay. So check that one out. Yeah. I will. Think of it. Yeah. Get a that's great. It. Yeah. I love checking out new films. So I'll certainly. That's certainly a favorite do. of mine. And Blue Jay is, was a very small, I believe, independent film. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It won mm. some awards a while back. It's a black and white film that was made maybe 10 years ago, Blue Jay. 
Okay. Two, well, that's two great. Favorite films of mine. So. Yeah. Well, I will check both those out. That's awesome. Yeah. Let me know what you think of them. Yeah, this I will. Has been delightful. Um, for anyone there in the department that hasn't had an interview yet, get have, have them get in touch for an interview because this is so much fun for me. <laughs> oh, you too, Kiki. It's so good talking to you. Oh, my gosh, so good. Want to end us with a short prayer? I would love to. Yes. Let's pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus, thank you so much. Um, thank you for Kiki and for art and theology and for life and how you speak through all things and make all things beautiful. And um, we just offer you this day. We offer you our lives, ourselves, um, that you would be glorified in all things. And um, we'll just end this session uh, by offering everything to Mary and her heart as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I just want to mention also for, for those who are listening here who um, don't know, J JP, John Paul II wrote a beautiful letter to artists. Yes. And it is available on the internet is google yes. jp2 letter to artists it's, it's not long it's mm -hmm. i don't know maybe 10 pages long um so if you're in the art world of in on any level whatsoever it's a, it's just an amazing document yes. so I'm going to squeeze that in here yes and thank course, you yeah jp the great catholic university check it out online um wonderful place i know there's a lot of homeschoolers will be um listening to this as well so um Check it out. Yes, please <laughs> do. Was, you know, I'd be taking courses, so. <laughs> yes. Hopefully I meet oh, some of you if you want this. So. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, Kiki. I really appreciate it. Yeah, wonderful talking wonderful. to you. Yeah, you too.